Welcome to The Summit Club, a weekly podcast series where I uncover the stories, the strategies, the pain and the elation behind the most highly performant people on earth. The Summit Club is based on one simple idea, that in the climb of life, there is no summit. Join me as we interview the very best performers across all human endeavors, as we uncover the tools and templates that they use to maximize their potential in their efforts to get to the summit. My guest today is Bertie Wimble, AKA Konsu the Child. He is a tech house DJ and producer based out of London. He's one of my good friends. I've known him for about six years. We've got a very interesting story about how we met. Super excited to speak to him today because frankly, tech house is my favorite genre of music. It's what I listen to every single day. If you guys are subscribers to my newsletter, I essentially post a tech house mix at the end of it every week. So you can go check that out. But we get to speak to Bertie today. He's had an incredible career so far and we catch him at a time where he's got some ascendancy in his career. He's got a couple of bangers that he released last week that are currently trending in the charts and also being played by the world's biggest DJ. So amazing opportunity to speak to him today and I hope you enjoy. Bertie, welcome to the Summit Club, mate. So good to have you. Thank you, mate. I've heard good things about this. So um, yeah, hopefully I don't drag down the tone a little bit, but <laughs> who, did, who, did, who did you hear that from? Um, you primarily. Um, I've just heard about the high caliber of what's going on here. So um, yeah, if I can keep that going just a little bit, then that's um, that's all good. <laughs> well, I'm hopefully we'll uh, we will actually deliver on that. I know that you will because uh, I've known you for quite a few years now, and uh, it's this is a little bit weird because I also know that you're essentially like a mile away from me right now. And as yeah. as always with these kind of things, it's easier to actually just open up a laptop and turn on the camera than it is to figure out timings for actually doing these things in person. But thank you so much for for agreeing to spend some time with me. Let's give a little bit of context into how we know each other. And perhaps I'll hand that over to you. Like it's been six years, I think, since we first met. I mean, the uh, the pandemic's taken away a chunk of my timeline. So it's always a bit sort of uh, hit and miss with this, but it was, um, it was Baldur's Air, wasn't it? um and and the ski season um i mean that to be honest um was kind of where the dj thing picked up on which we'll obviously go into a bit later on but that's kind of where everything the whole, this you know invite to the podcast sort of came about but um i seem to remember you were, you were semi decent at skiing i think we more, more saw each other in the clubs and the after and the after bars us um yeah more so than the slopes probably but um yeah it was a good few months wasn't it was it six it was a very yeah. good few months so like the the context is is that we were both drivers in an alpine ski resort in france called val yeah, and yeah. we were the we were tasked with getting up super super early in the freezing cold in the dark um, going ferrying people around resorts taking them to and from different places to the ski slopes and uh living a lifestyle where there was very little sleep there was a lot of alcohol um not when driving but there was a lot of uh a, a lot of quite loose behavior uh and as a lifestyle goes but on the flip side it was also a lot of fun right it was great i mean i think what was it it was uh 2016 or just after wasn't it so we just had brexit we've got trump we've got lots of lots of things going on in the world and i think when you go out to the alps i mean the only thing that matters in the day is is you know like what's your shifts you know, is it sunny? Am I going up the mountain today? Like, what runs are we going to do? Like, what bar are we going to go to afterwards? I mean, it was six months of, of, of sort of paradise, really. I mean, if you're into skiing, it was, uh, yeah, not much wrong with it, actually, which was good. Like, the responsibilities are quite loose, weren't they? There, were, there wasn't much, much going on in terms of responsibilities. Just don't crash. Yeah, which, yeah, I mean, is hot, easiest. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard with a Land Rover. Um, which I had, I mean, I can't remember which one did your company have you and, um, VIP. I had, I had a V I had a Volkswagen. So I had oh, a okay. giant Volkswagen, yeah. Transporter van. So it like could fit nine people in, um, and it had never driven anything that big, but felt, uh, felt un unequipped, but in the end it turned out to end up being, being a good driver. Just couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. Which actually considering that a lot of the time we're running on, on fairly little sleep was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> time. We, we survived without the tail so yeah it's it's all we, good. we did and like you said unfortunately we've had a couple of years which have essentially been written off and we'll talk a little bit about you because frankly in your profession um in the like uh kind of mu music and hospitality world was just completely killed for a couple of years and yeah. that must have been 
super hard and at a very interesting part like time in your in your career let's like start from the beginning though because we'll kind of we'll get we'll get to that stage you are can you can you give a little bit of insight into like how long you've been doing this for um yeah so i, I suppose it's probably been about 10 years of me djing at the moment um and i think as with most people get into it it always starts at you know you doing uni house parties and so i didn't even go to uni but i always sort of finished up my work here in london and then just pegged it straight down usually to bristol um as they had it sort of the music the music scene that i was really into which was sort of underground sort of housey techno disco sort of flavors um and a lot of my best mates went there which obviously also helps so um i think it was my best mate harry at the time he um he bought a little controller which i think a lot of people have that you plug into your laptop it's all you know a bit of this um and that's let's say 10 years ago um and i just got absolutely hooked with it um i didn't really have anywhere else to go apart from come back to london and just practice until i went back down there the next weekend and i think with me because you know, i was actually earning money and not in a student debt at that point um things have changed now obviously but um but yeah at the time so i used my first paycheck to bear uh, to buy a pair of decks um and they were a lot nicer than the, than the ones that my mates had at uni so by sort of hook or crook, I was invited to play down at all the house parties, not because I was any good at that time, but um, it was because I had the best equipment, essentially. So, um, so, so yeah, that came through the uni stages. Um, still was working my sort of nine to five job um, up here for three years. Um, left that, went to work for Warner Music, which was great because you kind of got a, you know, like an insight into the actual music industry in terms of how the cogs went, you know, with the, with the you know, international marketing which is the the uh, department i was in artist relations and all that kind of thing um and then and then yeah so i sort of then sort of thought right i'm just gonna go for it leave my job go on a bit of travel come back and that's when i had my residency in france um which is obviously where i met yourself um and then six months in ibiza off the back of that which was incredible um and then i decided i'm not going to sit behind a desk after that really so um uh, I kind of went into it and then it was not long after that that the pandemic all sort of started to unfurl and then here we are today but actually do you know what the pandemic it was it was terrible and I'm sure we'll talk about this I mean you know in, in a sec but I mean I kind of treated it like a half glass full situation um, I it kind of reassessed my my goals a little bit in terms of the industry and it sort of took every pub in the world to close for me to be like right there's no FOMO, no pressure of just, you know, going out and because DJing and music, it's a very social industry, right? I mean, you you get there by meeting people, by going to events and things like that. But I think when everyone was in the same boat, it became a lot easier to kind of be like, right, let's lock down, let's make a load of production. Um, went to stay uh, with my parents, uh, my sister, which is out in the country, so not in London. Um, there was very little distraction there and um, produced some of the music that I'm releasing today. So you know, it's it's put me in a better stead, I think, going forward, which was, which was good. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure where the last last year's gone, but it's 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 going in the right direction, which is good. Let's talk let's talk about that because from my my position as a good friend of yours, I know exactly how well it's going. So let's talk a little bit about production uh, because you picked this up about ten years ago, and back then, ten years ten years ago, access to information was completely different to now, right? Like yeah. kids who might be inspired to maybe pick up DJing through watching stuff on TikTok or Instagram and YouTube, as opposed to you picked it up from just being in parties and very, very, very different. Um, how how do you think that like your progress through kind of playing through to production, how do you think that happened? And where did what was that journey like? Like how did you how did you learn? Um well, I think from from DJ and production, are obviously, two very different things, right? So um, I was DJing ten years ago. I definitely wasn't producing. Producing only came uh, when I came back from Ibiza, uh, and and unfortunately, the the day and age of a DJ just being a DJ is kind of gone. I mean, you've got some freaks of nature like you know DJ EZ and people like that who are just unbelievably good. And if you look sort of back at the old vinyl DJs, that's you know incredible stuff. But um, unfortunately, now because so many so many people are DJing, so many people are producing, you really have to cut it through production. And that's what's going to get you on the bill and stuff. So I think DJing, if we take them like separately as their own categories, DJing is just hours in, you know, studying the crafts. I mean, 
you know, you've got, as you said, how you consume knowledge right now, you've got YouTube tutorials on pretty much everything. You've got um, DJ classes and courses like Point Blank and everything, which, you know, when I was sort of growing up, I don't think there was that much of that. Or maybe I just, I wasn't really looking at it really at the time until I realized how much I just absolutely love it. Um, but production is a bit self-taught for me, which probably is evident in my earlier works actually. But, um, uh, you know, there, there are courses which, you know, you can always go on. I think collaboration is really key as well. Um, I think with one, a couple, a couple of my tracks, I went down to sit in a studio with um, a guy called James Herr, who does all of the tool room stuff. And wow, like that was just such a big like eye opener for me. Like I, I was just there, not really even saying much, you know, like I had like ideas on my tracks and he was helping me mix them down and stuff. But like just the way he did it with just like putting everything into, I mean, Ableton and Logic, um, and just like stemming the tracks down you know he had a million different plugins i'm sorry this might be some double dutch to, to some people like just you know they're just starting in with it but um so so no like this is this is the kind of stuff i like i love kind of getting these teasing these details out so yeah if you want to yeah. like tell us what your your tool stack is what what platform is using what things are using because there will be some people who watch this and they're like okay well this is where i need to go first yeah so so i mean i guess you've got your two main um sort of doors um your two main sort of um production suites if you like which are ableton and logic um but then you've sort of got fruity loops and a whole load of others um but sort of slightly smaller fry um ableton which is the one i've got is quite it's quite um uh, sort of gray black and white it's very german so it's very like if you <laughs> if you like your um you know your your kind of industrial techno kind of the underground type sounds um and 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 platforms and obviously the germans are probably one of the best of the best in terms of their music whereas obviously logic is also great but it's a bit more sort of color coded it's a bit it's an easier layout for someone who's just getting into it but i mean me personally maybe being a bit biased towards ableton like as soon as you sort of delve down into ableton you find their plugins they're like their the plugins that come with the um the the suite are just amazing um so and i mean it's six of one there's no best there's no right or wrong answer with that i mean there's just you know just two different different platforms and stuff but um and then i mean the plugins are essentially the um the digital side of what you can download for the software <laughs> so you've got sort of you know like eqs and and, and all sorts you can shape sounds there but i guess the um where you can just choose to spend a lot of money or, or not so much i guess is is in the hardware so you'll see some people like the digital synths where they you know play in the keys um or you've got sort of drum pads and things like that and that's just a minefield you know you have to they're quite expensive you have to wait for birthdays and christmases to come around <laughs> sure. especially if you're in the uh in the younger younger cohort um but uh but yeah and then you know technology is getting better and better is exactly as you said you know um so you know and that's that's the same with dj equipment as well you know the, the cdjs are just getting ridiculous um i mean they're like spaceships now i mean they fully are you know the, the mixes i mean pioneer is is the one i i tend to prefer if i'm playing at a club set um but yeah they're, they, they're getting phenomenal now i think it's the v10 or the v12 mixer which is out from pioneer at the moment um which is the one i used at rise festival last year um, nice. before, before patrick topping because i was on his his rider so i was at the mercy of his rider a little bit so he had sort of six decks going on and and this and and um i'd used the, the mixer before but not that one so I, in the in the the taxi on the way to the main stage i was googling how to use them <laughs> which was a bit a bit hectic at the time but i think i mean it, it's the same brand you, you know you can get it you just have to yeah, yeah. just channel it and not go too hard but um yeah i mean it's the when you talk about equipment when it comes to production there's there's no right formula i mean you, you've got the, the main channels that people go down with with your drum pads with your diff, like your moog synthesizers and everything else but you know there's there's so many different you know some producers may have made sort of um chart topping songs with with just a, a standard keyboard and a tiny drum pad on the top of that keyboard you know yeah so it's, it's more your creativity which is the 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 limit i guess rather than well, external you know bits well on the on the note of charts let's talk about charts because in the past week you now currently have two new releases that are yeah. currently sitting on the uh on the Bport chart. Tell us yeah. a bit a little bit about your genre. So give like for people that have no idea about uh, about house music or EDM, like what exactly is the genre that you have? Because selfishly, you are you you <laughs> are an artist in my favorite genre. So yeah. I love all the stuff that uh, when I listen to your music and you 
I'm like, and I tell you this all the time, you make absolute bangers. And the proof is the proof is currently you're seeing the proof because not yeah. only have you now got currently in the, in the chart, uh, two of your releases, brand new releases, but you've also got one of the biggest DJs on earth at the moment, who's going around, who immediately added in one of your tracks into his track, into his like set list last yeah. week. Tell us a little bit about that because right now I've been like riding on a high seeing this in the yeah. last kind of like 10 days. And it's amazing to see your, because yeah. we were hanging out before Christmas and you, you know, you had a much bigger intent to, to really push the production forward and you just hit the ground running this year. Tell us a little bit about what it feels like to have some bangers in the charts and the biggest DJs in the world playing your music. I mean, it's, it's, um, I mean, it's a bucket list, right? I mean, it's always, it's been a bucket list for me um, for a long time. I've had, um, I've been on sort of compilation EPs and albums from various labels like Low Ceiling and, and Who Works and stuff. And, you know, you get there and, you know, it's exciting to see, you know, your name amongst others in the charts, but really to have like a piece of work that's your own. Um, I say it was your own, it's, it's, an, it's my EP, but the lead track on it, I did actually with a chap called Kid Card from, um, from Oz. So um, again, which... We'll talk about it in a sec, but um, yeah. collaboration, collaboration is so key. Um, but um, yeah, for me, it was great. So we had Madonna, which is the name of the EP. It was signed on Distortion, uh, which is a sort of Spanish label. And uh, yeah, it, it was. it's always very nice when you get a, uh, an email from the label and you sort of wake up and you say, right, it's in the charts. It means we've got more promo to do, you know, like push it out, get it on the socials. Here we go, do this, do that. Um, and then they send you through the promo in terms of who's been playing it out. And it is really exciting to see. And so that for me was was great. So it's in the, the, the tech house, as you, you went back to genre. So tech house is is the my my main genre. Um and that doesn't mean to say that's you know the only stuff I like or play out, but just if you have to, you know, it's important to try and get kind of find your feet on and in, in one specific a specific place in terms of um in terms of electronic music um and then transmission which was the second sort of the, the b-side track i guess which is kind of a support animal track to madonna really which i really liked but i thought the main focus was going to be on madonna because madonna's more vocal led that's when uh, uh james hype put it in his um in his sort of helicopter chart which is helicopters his new release so these are all the tracks that he's playing in his his sets based off that. Um, and this just goes to show the effect of just having a, a popular DJ or, or, again, one of the biggest DJs in the world on side at the moment. Um, because, you know, a load of a load of up and coming DJs who have got house party sets or have got new club sets, or whatever, sort of trust his judgment a little bit. So kind of go in there, which I have I have comments on as well in terms of I think it's really important to find your own music. <laughs> And I, you know, like kind of create your own sets and don't necessarily copy the big ones. But for me, in this instance, it's worked because, you know, he's he's put my track there and it's it's done well. And it's and we're at 33, which it was a 39 yesterday. It's climbing ever sort of slowly up. So we're, we're fingers crossed for the big push on number 10. Um, so sick. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's good, man. It's good. Um, just long may that continue, really. And I think it's it's now about consistency, right? It's all it, it's quite easy when you when you put out stuff which is doing well to then sort of fall back on it right and just be like just kind of watch it go but actually really this is the time to put you know the the, the pedal to the metal or whatever it is and 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 kind of just keep producing because people you know if you just slip out the charts and then in six months time you've got another one people don't really know you you really need to you know keep going and sort of keep yeah. producing this music which is why i've got you know a load of other collaborations on the go next track's coming out on march the third i've kind of try and do a few sort of maybe SoundCloud edits before then and just keep yourself current really. But um, fingers crossed this is the start, mate. <laughs> the start of the challenge. Just mate. the start. Well, like I said, kind of selfishly, so James Hype is one of my favorite content creators. So not only is he a DJ that is seemingly just playing in a different kind of universe from a skill set perspective, but when it comes to the content game around, he does an incredible vlog around his lifestyle. So he's vlogging essentially like every day and building an amazing brand around him and his his lifestyle and his music and he's gaining a huge following online and and has kind of gone in that inflection point and yeah. it's a big validator to see your songs getting selected by someone who just plays he's got a very very specific sound that he wants to 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 like take out to the masses and it's amazing that he you know 
sees that and picks that up. But yeah. to your point about consistency, because that's actually been one of my one one of my focuses for this year. Do you did you have that? Do you think you had that insight a couple of years ago? Like the the importance of this has gone really well, but actually now this is when I've got to start. I've got to keep on putting in the work. So consistency in terms of music production or in terms yeah. of social media, in terms of, yeah. Um, yes. Again, it's it's just so much easier said than done, um, which is kind of why one of the things, you know, I wish I'd have said to myself with, with the hindsight that I know now really is just putting those hours in because, you know, I had my, you know, at this very start, you know, you, when you start producing, you know, I had my other job as well, or I was doing little bits on the side to try, to try and make it work. And um, when you get to the weekend, you just want to be playing the gigs. You just want to, and especially when you start off um, making music, you know, your first stuff is always going to sound a bit shy. Let's, let's, let's not leave around the bush. It's always going to, you know, when you're learning stuff and you put out your first tunes, your first mixes, you know, stuff's going to go wrong. And, you, you know, you only learn through through that kind of thing. But that's also a really easy way to get sort of persuaded not to keep going. You know, um, you know, if you're if you're if you're listening to the best DJs and the best producers and going to clubs, you know, your, your print works and your, all, all the kind of that, you know, fabric and everything else. And they're just sounding incredible. And then you just go back to the studio really excited and you just make something that's just crap. And you're just like, oh, well, you know, what's the point? But like, I just promise you, there is a threshold which you, you will reach and then stuff will start happening. And then. You know, like right now, if I go into to making um, tunes on a, on a fresh project, I've got sort of various sort of drum pads and drum samples saved that I've really liked, which have worked before. So for me to start a project now will be so much quicker than anyone who's just started because I have this like really nice foundation that I can just go from. And that only comes with just time in, really. So So for now, it's easier for me to do the consistency sort of thing. But at the start, like... It is a lot harder because you know I'd have to work twice, three times as hard to get a tune out than I than I do now because it's just you know. And hopefully in the future I'll have to work less and less. You know, <laughs> hopefully I'll be wonderful. I'll just roll into the studio and just get one out in half an hour. So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, we'll see. But yeah, consistency is important. Um, and I think obviously it's consistency with production, but it's also consistency with you know getting yourself on the on the right bill in terms of the right lineup. For, for gigs festivals getting yourself like all over the place um social media has never been one that i've been particularly good at i kind of just more like the you know the physical in terms of going and doing the doing the gigs or making music and stuff um but obviously in the day and age of tiktok and everything as you said you know music trends and you look at a lot of the tech house specifically the tech house charts and a lot of the sound bites and things are you know directly correlated to what's you know going off on tiktok and you know yeah. market and stuff so um luckily i've got a you know a manager who's who's pretty on the ball with with that kind of thing and, and sort of sending it across and um yeah i mean it's, it's it's a different game you know it's ever evolving that's just life isn't it in, in every industry. yeah especially now i think the speed of evolution is so fast and yeah. everything's yeah. innovating at a rapid speed and you've just got to be on your toes you just can't be you can't you have to be trying to be trying to think okay well what is the next frontier where where am i going to con continue having a competitive advantage because like you said one of your competitive competitive advantages now is that you can create music faster than you could f a few years ago and you just you, it's things like that where you can you can layer on those levels and you now understand the game um of yeah. djing and the artistry can you tell us a little bit about the game itself and stuff that you probably maybe you came into it not really having foresight but now you look back you're like i would l have loved to have told myself to be prepared for this can you talk about the lifestyle uh, so the lifestyle is i mean it, it's a tough one isn't it because i mean the dj lifestyle is it's it doesn't have the longest you know the most longevity in it in terms of you know i mean you've got you've got people like fatboy slim who you know do it really right you know they're, they're still there you know they're sort of, their prime and absolutely loving it. you can see it through their socials you can see it through their gigs the amount of energy they go give off is just is insane but um a lot of djs when you hit a certain age you, you still you know maintain with their music you obviously go to the more like record label route and stuff like that but i think when you when you start um oh, the things i would have told myself well um <laughs> i think it's um a lot of it is is networking and being really social like i there was definitely a few gigs 
that I was doing or a few residency I was doing and I still do to, to a degree or getting less so hopefully but um which are sort of sort of more paying the bills gigs because you really want to go to this industry but you know you're trying to sort of put all the eggs in one basket a little bit and I think really this industry is is so sociable um you're only going to get gigs if you meet promoters meet um you know booking agents meet other djs you know who you know you invite them to come play somewhere you have a contact and vice versa and everything else so um i think going to going to events like you know if there's anyone who's trying to get into the industry going to events like ade so amsterdam dance event which is every october um you know i'm about to head over to miami music week in a sec just again a lot a lot of networking and stuff like that and i think just go and put yourself out there um and i'm not saying that if you've got sort of new songs again before you think they're fully polished put them out there because but just get your face there and get to know people because they're a lot more likely to like anything really to respond to an email if you've met them face to face because there are a lot of people who want to uh, you know more so djs who want a very small amount of um, dj sets to be filled at various clubs and if you're the guy who's gone out there who's gone out to amsterdam who's gone out to somewhere and you know they're the ones in the uk as well right but um if you put the effort in to to do that and i didn't do that enough when i was sort of going up i was just trying to grab different gigs from contacts like we were in my own circle but i think if you expand that circle you know it just it just gets better bigger and better and i think if you look at like solid grooves and abode and and you know these are all sort of kind of quite big names if if you know Ibiza, you know they've got their residents right and their residents will take those resident resident slots and then i have some of the headliners and i mean all the residents are unbelievable as well right but if you if you're not um haven't bought a ticket to the races you're not going to win do you know what i mean you have to you know get there and and be there so um yeah i kind of wish i'd done that a lot more and then like i said it's just it's time like the time you put in on the weekends the time you put in not just going to the pub and i know that's so easy so easier said than done um but after especially after a long week of work and stuff but um really what you get in you put out um so true in the industry but um yeah product production especially but you know get those whatever decks you have whether it be a controller or you know, your full full sort of cdj setup or vinyl setup just go and practice your mixes go um go deep diving into some um into some uh you know uh, um what's it soundcloud sort of rabbit hole where you can find some edit that no one else has and then you play that someone films it you know puts it on socials and suddenly so you're being talked about and things like that so i don't know there's no one answer to that there's just like lots of elevating all the different parts of the pie i guess to like come up um but yeah and i guess that's just a case of like time in the industry right like there is there's typically the same in at least my experience most jobs i've had like yeah. until you've done it you just don't know and th there's not there's not many instances where just time in the game actually gives you uh, gives you access to the rules and, and lets you understand okay well these are the rules i need to play by yeah, can you yeah. talk to, talk to me a little bit about the process of releasing music because i actually only found this out last year for especially kind of edm and house music the the, the genre that you deal with and it for me i probably was like okay well you know why wouldn't why can't you just release a song every week like why can't why can't you know you can make a song every week and you know upload it to spotify and then i got schooled someone was like no 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 that's that's not how it works can you explain to someone that doesn't have a clue like what is the 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 broad process of you creating a song and then getting it out to the masses and i potentially getting to a point like you having a chart you know chart topping song so i i kind of have uh, i mean just on my experience i have a little bit of a different well just a different take on it so i i when I got back from Ibiza, just went straight on to straight onto Ableton, tried to make, you know, baby steps at this point. You know, I was trying to be like, you know, my mum on Spotify, you know, just trying to have like some tangible benefit to me, like to for like, you know, so I, I would just have have uh, family and friends sort of get off my back about the industry choice that I tried to make. But um signed it to a very small uh American label called Bonfire Records. And they put it out there. I didn't really think too much about it. Bear in mind, this is my first experience of releasing music. Um, it was a following, I think it was a following day. They sort of said, check the, the German charts. And it was above Rihanna, Drake and David Guetta in their standard charts. That was the first everything I'd done. And it was, you know, some of it wasn't even in key. So I was like, you know what I mean? I was a little bit, 
Yeah, I'm hoping no one else listens to this podcast now. No, hang on, hang on. You've got to tell people, what's the song? Yeah. Which track are you talking it's, about? It's, it's called Energy. So it's pro- approaching sort of quarter of mil streams. Um, the um, Budweiser of users there sort of wrote a Tomorrowland advert in the States, which is is good. But like, this is my first ever experience of it, right? So, you know, the label afterwards were like, well, do you have anything else? And I was no, no, no. It's gonna be um, so... So yeah, so basically went sort of back, back to the, uh, you know, back to the studio, just just kept on trying. Things weren't sounding as good. And this is why I got a bit frustrated with myself, you know, because, you know, I assumed that it was as easy as that to get, you know, success. But it's, it's just not, you know what I mean? Like, you really do need to put in the hours. And and, um, and then I guess more now to relate it to your point is where I should have started is really sort of struggling, I guess, to get that first song out there and, because there aren't, there's these self-release platforms, and I've done that before with like sort of TuneCore, DistroKid, CD Baby, which you can release by yourself, but then you do all the admin. So they'll take either a sort of a, a, a you know twenty dollar uploading fee, which happens you know happens yearly, or they might take sort of five percent of of the royalties of the track, whatever that makes. Um, but obviously, if you sign it to a label, which first of all then has to go through the quality test of their A and R teams, and you know get signed and stuff. Um, but then they'll, you know, they'll put it to death, you know, they'll do all the marketing, you know, they'll do all the distribution. It's kind of then out of your hands, which is quite nice. Um, you know, because then, you know, they 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 deal with everything. You can just get back onto making your music and, you know, you know, dealing with hopefully the gigs that come from that release. But um, so but I, I wouldn't sort of shun away from any sort of junior producers. If you've got a track you really like, and just to get on, you know, sort of a sort of chalk mark on the board as such, you can definitely go down those routes and it's fairly low cost um you know ultimately if you don't like it further down the line because you own all the rights to it you can remove it um but i would also kind of discourage against just putting up anything for the sake of putting up anything like you've got to really love this tune and I, i'd say like I, i've kind of sat on tunes for too long before and thought they were really good but was too maybe too embarrassed to put them to other people but i'd definitely say you know before putting them out maybe, maybe put them across to like a few mates who are like within the industry just and people who you know will give you honest feedback right um because i think it's really important to not sort of cloud your spotify page with just a load of crap because otherwise you know if, if you want to sign to a, a really good label you've got a track further down the line that's way better you know the, the first thing the labels are going to do is look at your spotify they're going to look at your socials they're going to they're going to sort of background check you um which you know, maybe is the way it should be, but they've got a brand to protect and everything else. Um, so yeah, you need to you you can you can do the self relief release route. Just be careful with it. Um, with the labels, sort of go small, build credibility, and then get bigger and bigger. Um, it's obviously very easy to see. I mean, there's a, uh, if you look at the tech house charts at the moment, there's a guy called Mal P who did the drugs from Amsterdam track. And then he's just got one called Give Me um, Give Me That Bounce, I think, which is currently top of the tech, uh, top of the beatport charts um, across genre. And they're his first two tracks out. He might've had something under a different alias before, but it's so rare. And I wouldn't get hung up as, as a new producer on just being like, wow, my first song wasn't top of the beatport charts. So therefore I'm crap. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think you have to have a bit of realism. Some, some people just completely hit the ground running. Um, and others, you know, it takes a bit of time, takes a bit of experience, build up the contacts. Um, again, ADE, going back to that, you have, you know, conference where you've got all the labels and the, you know, all the, the main labels, I guess, with at least a contingent of, of their staff there. And you can you can go with them to a memory stick with a memory stick and just say, you know, I'm a producer. And, and if you get on well with them, they're more likely to listen to your demos, um, even provide criticism, like, you know, feedback, but like in a creative way, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's that, um, and there's also places like Tour Room Academy. Um, I'm sure Defected have something probably similar, where you know you can you can get in and you can have you know all the tips from some of the biggest people in that label, which is going to put you on sort of higher favour. So, um, yeah, again, there's no one way. I mean, with all these questions, it's I mean it's a beautiful industry. I absolutely love it, and I wouldn't be anywhere else. But um, there's so many different parts to this. You know, so yeah. many more cogs, which is is just hard, but um yeah as long as you're like fully dedicated and just kind of willing to put the time in across the board then yeah jobs are good and i think well that, well that's funny that you tell the story about energy because that was 
probably the first time I connected with you after we got back from living together and it was maybe I don't know a year or so a couple of years and and I I was like I had no idea that was your first song that you had properly released um with a label and I was like it was the song the one song that I listened to that week on repeat and I think I just messaged you and I was like I, this is an absolute like banger didn't know it was so early in your kind of I just didn't didn't have that that kind of perspective and context around your history and with production and so knowing that where you've essentially had a like a you had a like a not a not a tap in but you had a, a massive win with one of your first ever attempts yeah do, do you think that you had do you think that's helped you in hindsight because now you respect how hard it is to get that and you kind of know okay well the route back is I just need to put reps because I can do it, but it's about putting the reps in. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, like I said, it def definitely gave me sort of like a checkered idea of how, how everything should start, you know? Um, and, and it doesn't really happen that way. And I think, like I said, you start, I started on a high and then went through a bit of a dip where I just thought everything was, you know, should it be better? And I think this is the, if you ask any, any producer, I mean, how many tracks have they started in, uh, compared to how many are actually out there? I mean, the ratio is probably like 10 to one, right? So you you start loads of projects, you get really excited, you sit listening to the same eight bar loop like a million times, trying to add things, things that then make it just worse. And then you bin it and move on. And I think don't get hung up on those kind of things because, you know, this happens. And I, I did, you know, it's, I'm only saying this because it happened to me. Um, and it's only sort of, recently like i said from the from the pandemic really going forward it's kind of where i i learned to to really entrust my projects with other people who could give it you know give it sort of flavors which i wouldn't have thought to put on um like i said the madonna one with this chap in um kid card in um in australia working with a guy called Mekaway from um egypt and all of them are just like really, if you if you connect with people on SoundCloud or or wherever it might be, who've got the same type as you, and generally, the music industry is is willing to help. You know, it's a sort of small, tight knit family. The the dance industry specifically, and it's all about sort of lifting each other up a little bit. And and I think you know, if you if you connect with someone and you know you send them ideas and tunes, and before you know it, you bounce off people, and you know they'll have. Everyone always has just different ideas about like what you know what's good and 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 I would have never come up with half the sounds I've done if it wasn't for some of these collaborations um so so yeah I mean it's it's taken me a while to get there it's taken me sort of six years so to go back to your point in terms of where energy started to then when I fell to and then now so where I'm going up to but I think definitely it's it's um it's sort of getting feedback from like a wider pool and yeah, I guess just entrusting my projects with other people and 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 vice versa. You know, I get sent stuff as well, um, which you know, if someone says, "Could you do something with?" Which was the same with Madonna. You know, that was the, um, you know, he sent me the vocal and the bass line uh, and a few drums and stuff, and then I changed and tweaked some bits and and that's where you can get the 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 quick projects out there. You know, sometimes you sit on a project for you know however long. I think the the track that I've got, Deja Vu, coming out in on the 3rd of March has, has been in the pipeline for like two years. And so to the point where I've heard it loads, um, you know, we, we both know Danny Chapman, um, who uh, is, is yeah, as a mutual friend, <laughs> I sent him the private link of this and he's the one who's going to stream it, you know, probably the most, but he, um, he took this link and I got the, the same SoundCloud link I went to two days later and it had 80 plays and he was the only one I sent it to. <laughs> he was rinsing it. So like, I've got like some people, you kind of forget that like once you've been listening to the same track for a while and it hasn't come out for a while, but it's, you know, it might be signed somewhere. You keep listening to it and you kind of get bored of it. You know, I do feel like, you know, there's some, some artists who have got famous of one song and, you know, they're expect whenever anyone comes to a festival or club, they're expected to play it. Yeah. You know, sometimes people are really upset when they don't and it's like well you know I, gu I guess you can't really complain at that point because that's probably got you those those gigs and you have to do it <laughs> but um yeah certainly it certainly was a few in the locker which i just can't wait to get out and just move on to the next and just keep amazing fresh, fresh ideas but yeah just keep it moving i'd say how how often as an artist uh at your stage are you releasing music how often do tracks get released uh 
I mean, so last year was not as much as I wanted to because I spent probably more try more time trying to um, trying to like get a booking agent and sort of go down more the live route. Um, concentrated a lot of my summer gigs. I think a lot of coming out of lockdown has, has happened as well because everyone's so excited to get back to the live. Um, but I'd say in an ideal world, cause you, you want to release a track and then you want to have at least, I don't know, two, three, four weeks for it to breathe and for it to be out there. Because if you release another track straight away, then it's going to take a little bit of the of the, of the shine off, off, you know, what's already out there. Um, so ideally, if you look at sort of the Spotify curve, sort of as it's as you know the one tracks on its sort of on its sort of down downward turn if you like that's when you want to kind of release the next because it goes into everyone's release radars if you're talking about spotify um and and yeah and, but, and that's you know you don't know how long that's going to be because you don't know how long that chart's going to you know that track's going to stay in the charts i mean if you're talking about sort of fisher and losing it and stuff like that that's been in the beatport charts for two years three years i don't know when yeah. it was released, but it's, it's still there and obviously he's still releasing music because he needs to, but that's just when you get to stratospheric levels of stardom, right? But um, I'd say, yeah, you, you want to let it breathe a little bit. Obviously it depends with uh, house artists, you sign tracks or EPs usually to, diff to different labels and they all have their own um, sort of release catalog for the year. So you kind of slot in wherever kind of works and you just try and fit it that around your other, other releases where, if you're signed to a sort of a Warner Music or a Sony or a Universal, you know, you're you're always signed with them. So, you know, you'll be on an album deal or, you know, a single deal or whatever. And then they can pick and choose about when, you know, when that's going to be and pressure you into probably releasing music. Um, I worked with quite a few artists um, or know quite a few artists anyway who signed to these big labels. And uh, yeah, speaking about their release strategy is is always different, but that's sort of taken, you know, it's them with the label making that decision. But when you're in this sort of an independent artist stage, signing to different labels, you can kind of pick and choose and yeah, pick and choose your label as well. Um, obviously there's, you know, a big few that everyone wants to get, you know, get behind your defectives, your tour rooms, um, you know, Solid Oco is in Sonny Federa's label, um the south of saturn there's so many especially when it comes to the the tech house scene um all sort of vying for a place out in out in ibiza with the, with the big places but um yeah i wouldn't say there's there's a formula for that all i would say is don't don't rush it you know if you've got a track coming out every week you know people are going to skip past the the spotlight that, that should have on it on on one particular track and then just move on to the next and you, you won't get the streaming figures you might not even get the chart position you want because you know, you're rushing releases, basically. So, yeah. yeah. How many in a year, like, would be, you know, for reasonable for you this year? Like, what are we talking, like, 15, 10, 5? Like, what, where are we at with uh, releases? So I'd say I'd probably be happy with... So I've, I've had two out already, one coming out in March. I'd probably be happy with another four or five. Um if if they all hit the, you know hit the quality mark that I want right which yeah. I'm only I'm not, you know, not going to put out anything you you know you don't put your name behind um but I mean yeah some artists if I mean it also depends if you've got a, you know if you put out an EP at the start of the year which has four tracks on it and then another sort of two or three EPs throughout the year each with the same quantity of songs then you know it's naturally be longer but if you're if you're an artist that works and a lot of the time this is the case with house music you always have one track or two tracks so the single yeah. sort of two track EP, and I guess yeah, then it's maybe one one every once every two months would be a pretty good year, and then you might have then a few more chucked in the months in between. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but again, again, there's not there is no right answer to that question. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's, I mean, ultimately, we'd I'd like to be putting out because it's such a buzz putting out music. So ultimately, I'd want to be I'd want to be have that feeling every Friday, like of putting out. But that's just not conducive and that's pretty much impossible yeah. <laughs> but yeah how um so like say for example you've got um some of your biggest uh, like it, the people that inspire you the most yeah. who who would those people be Are, do you look to people for specific sounds anything like that 
it's again a tough one partly because having been in the industry for quite a while and then having gone to warner where before warner i was just so into house music and it was you know you you kind of dream sleep walk in a 4-4 beat it was just kind of that was just what happened and then when i went to warner i was listening to you know obviously you work on campaigns with sort of um indie artists and you know obviously pop artists and you kind of appreciate the production value that goes behind you know synths in a in a pop song or indian i think that actually is you know if you look at music that's coming back now if you look at patrick topping if you look at ben hemsley um a lot of people bringing up bringing back in sort of flavors of trance or flavors of something else and trying to just sort of keep you know the new the sounds that are coming out keeping them sort of fresh and current rather than just the tech house sound which again sort of with Fisher took a, a bit of a rise and and you know your James Hypes and everything else which is still super popular and it's it's nice to see sort of that stuff really hitting hard in the states as well which is ultimately where house originated in sort of your Detroit's and your, your Chicago's and stuff but um you know Europe's then sort of taken a mainframe with that and it's you know house music in that form is coming back but you know leaning into techno and trance and bringing back like a, you know Ibiza 2000 sounds and stuff is is um is really cool so from that from that point of view to say sort of who's a favorite artist is is quite hard um you've got a lot of artists like joshua and uh, mark neakin and people like that who are taking sort of uh, samples from sort of 90s tracks and, and hip-hop tracks and stuff and, and putting it into the into the mainframe and that's what's charting really well so you know putting them in in sets is always going to be a bit of a win um, especially as a bit of a get out of jail free card as well, which which you always need in the set. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd probably go back to people like Ben Hemsley, um, uh, Ewan McVicker as well is doing incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, Newcastle and, and Scotland and the North generally are doing very well right now. I think for people from the South, we need to we need to take a bit of a step up in our game. <laughs> um, well, it's on you, mate. That uh, yeah, it's on your yeah. shoulders. You've got yeah. to be rep- representing the South when it comes to the tech house scene. Oh, uh, tell, yes. mate. Tell me a little bit about uh, about the difference between an EP, a single, and when is is there a step to an album anymore? Like for for artists like yourself, or is that just is that not a thing anymore? Yeah, there. I mean, there is. There's certainly dance artists that do albums. If you look at Frankie Wah and and you know a lot of um, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the stuff I listen to is sort of more down the techno lane. In terms of like chill, like melodic techno, in terms of Tale of Us and and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of the le- electronic stuff. If you if you go down New Music Friday, you'll see, you know, a lot of incredible um, electronic artists who have got the albums. Um, I think obviously you single is self-explanatory. Um, an EP for me, I think we go from anywhere between sort of two and five tracks. Um, and then a, a sort of an album would be sort of six and beyond. I, I, there might well be a matrix to that, but like that's kind of what I've had in my head for a while. Um, and, and, and you know, an EP doesn't have to be, you know, five of your original tracks. It could be sort of three of three tracks of yours and a couple of remixes from other artists of, of those tracks. Um which is obviously always great again because you tap into their fa- their, their fan base the um the remixer um which my previous track with distortion you know it was great because they were searching around some of their resident artists on the label to say who wants to remix this tune and then you you know you tap into them which always works always works well um but yeah, with, with yeah with an album um is that something that potentially you thought about or is that down the line when does I mean, it's, it would be, I think it would always be like a, a dream to get that. I think anybody who's works in music and produces music wants an album, you know, um, and from there I'd straight go and press it on vinyl and get some amazing artwork done and, you know, really have something to like hold and treasure. Um, but I think from, from my point of view, I'm a long way off because I quite like the EP. I quite like the sort of uh, one, two, three track kind of signed to, because then you can sign it to different labels and you can kind of kind of quickly right. do this. I think if you if you're si- if you're an artist that's signed to a um well obviously outside Warn is Sony Universal but if you're sort of signed to a um an afterlife or or you know sort of a, and you've got a piece of work like Colin who did um uh I mean I think it was probably an EP but you know he does a lot of stuff with um afterlife and 
Um, and I get that because they're a huge label. And if I had a massive label backing behind me, then I'd have more incentive to do an album. But I think at the moment, you know, I'm really enjoying collaborating with different artists, as I was sort of mentioning before, and sort of getting different flavors out there. Because if you collaborate with different artists, and inevitably the, the two sounds are going to be sort of slightly different. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it's a bit of a way off. But I think if I'm looking to my to my goals, then yeah, it's something that I'd like to do at some point. And is that something that typically gets initiated by a label then? Is that something where a label will come to you and be like, we'd like you to make an album? What's the process? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the time, if you get sort of an upfront um, sort of fee from a label, and I, again, it's we're mainly talking about the majors now. Within dance music, it's not necessarily a, not necessarily a thing. But in, in the, the big labels, you know, if you were a Coldplay or whatever it might be, you, you'd be signed to... You know, they'll they'll give you an idea of you know th- a three album three album deal worth X as an upfront cost, and then obviously you'll and then all the the percentage terms and everything else after that. But yeah, you'll be given like an upfront upfront fee for for a certain uh, like a certain amount of work per se, and I, I that's on them to decide how many tracks in the album that's going to be and everything else. I mean, there's no yeah. there's no direct formula for that, but um, yeah, I think in dance music it is very different. I'd say. Yeah. I saw a video on TikTok or Instagram last night and it was David Guetta and <laughs> he, he was in his in a hotel room, don't know yeah. where, and it was a warning. It was a warning video where he was like, this is my life. And he turned the camera around and he showed a room, a, be- a hotel, it must have been a hotel room and full of suitcases, maybe like 15 giant suitcases. And he turned the camera back around and he said, I haven't been home and keep in mind that we're now in January and he's like, I have not been home since the end of the Ibiza season, which as you know, is like what, like September. And so he hasn't been home for like four months. And this is a guy who one of, you know, top five biggest DJs in the world. And to think about that, that is the lifestyle, you know, he doesn't need money, right? doesn't need any money doesn't need to be performing but yet he still does two questions like that is the lifestyle the lifestyle that he has if you could kind of paint a little bit of a picture around that specific you know the biggest djs in the world what their lives lifestyles are like and you know do you have an intent to have that lifestyle do you you know is that something that you that you want um and then the the downsides of like this as a as a career, uh, because you know why would someone who doesn't need the money still be living in hotels ninety percent of the time? Like, why do you think why do you think David Guetta is still doing it? I mean, ultimately, he's doing it for a love of the craft, right? Um, and that's just you know production, um, DJing, and I mean, it is so addictive. I mean, anyone who gets into it, I mean, maybe off the back of of, of you know, listening to anything that we've said today or, or just generally um it you know it's it's super addictive and it is an incredible feeling to 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 play your own music out to people and just to to really have you know a stage sort of presence when it comes to making people dance ultimately making people you know feel good really but it is there is a lot of it which is just sort of admin sort of hassle and and travel um i mean I mean, not to put, I mean, it's a bit of a you know sad story, but, you know, if you look at Avicii, you know, Avicii sadly took his own, own life and, and you know, but a lot of that was attributed to, to music pressures. I mean, I obviously, could have, we don't know what's going on inside his head otherwise, but, you know, he was on the road constantly and you always get these, you know, when it comes to sort of major label or, or big pressure for, or, you know, people buying your tickets around the world for venues and, you know, you go there and you... you you know, you see DJs in, you know, traveling down in Australia or, you know, Japan or doing tours in, you know, various parts of the world. And you think it's a holiday with like a few gigs sort of bolted on. But actually, you know, you go there, you do your gig, you go to the hotel room, you wake up, you go to the airport, you just go straight up to the next place. And it's kind of exhausting. I mean, I've, I haven't, you know, fully experienced that. Um, but again, have, have people in the music industry that I know who have. And yeah, it's it's crazy. But it, again, if you ask them, would you be anywhere else in the world or doing anything else? They'd say no, right? It, it's it's 
it's it's an addictive trait but it's you know you just got to know that there's a lot of there's a lot of um late nights followed by early mornings followed by a lot of travel followed by all this kind of stuff um and and you know it's it's not necessarily all plain sailing so yeah. and, and i think from that point of view you know you do have to take after your mental health i mean it's very easy to go straight into this you know this this thing of, of being caught up with you know having your rider and what's on your you know your, your rider being you know what's in your your green room and your dressing room beforehand and you know just putting on a ton of alcohol and just going from sloppy night to sloppy night and whatever and you know it's you know, it can be fun once in a while but like you know if you if you're if you are that touring dj and playing sort of five six nights a week then you know it's really unsustainable and ultimately that's when you see uh djs when they when they get a little bit older you know some will drop off for that reason you know they've just kind of burnt the candle really hard at both ends and i mean david getta is i've i he again was someone who was at warner when i was there so i've met him a few times and he's um pretty sort of head screwed on when it comes to that kind of thing from from what i got in my limited interaction but um uh yeah i i, I it's important for him i think it's quite a good post for him to have done actually to show to, to you know to show people going into the industry that you know it's not just going to be you going to pay on a beach and then having this week holiday and then getting paid loads and going there like you really do have to live in a suitcase sometimes um yeah so yeah i would yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fairly accurate depiction i'd say of, of someone especially of his level like you said in the top five djs in the world um yeah a pretty accurate depiction of, of kind of what it's like um, yeah i something because i see for for example i look at people that do like residencies uh, music artists that do residencies in places like Las Vegas or people like Elton John who are still playing you know I think he's only just recently retired but he was playing with severe health problems um, all of these things that were going against him but what I can see like the, you look at so many examples Paul McCartney is still playing the, the Rolling Stones are still playing there's something that it's so clear to me that the the opportunity to kind of create and uh, be in front and be in front of a stage and like give an experience to people and the feeling of that is clearly unrivaled like there's there's nothing else once you experience that it's so obvious but at the same time it, it does clearly come with a lot of downside can we talk a little bit about your specific lifestyle um, how your year tends to be structured um, if there's kind of seasonality and then also you know I've spent a lot of time with you and I'll be honest, like there's a lot of the time where you're, you know, you're not going to bed until, especially in the summer, the sun is coming up again. How the hell do you deal with that stuff? Um, <laughs> the answer is I'm still working it out. You know what I mean? I mean, I think I've, I've, I've taken definitely, even in the last sort of 12 months, uh, it, it was very strange as we talked about the pandemic sort of went in a dip and then you kind of just throw yourself into all these events and kind of, go that way a little bit more um and then now the pendulum is slightly start, hopefully starting to balance out a little bit and i think um yeah sort of picking and choosing your battles and this is where you know like putting the time into into studio and actually getting the bigger and better gigs means you can kind of pick and choose your battles a little bit um you know whereas before i might have to dj five nights a week you know just just for the paycheck and and you know some of them are ones you don't necessarily want to do um I mean, I, I, you know, put me behind a deck anywhere and I, and I absolutely love what I do, but do you know what I mean? Like there, there are certainly some that are, you know, better, better gigs than others where you have a bit more musical freedom, as you say. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it is tough waking up, you know, you know, playing a, a set from, you know, a, a rise festival where we both were, you know, the set was from five to uh, three to five in the morning. And then you sort of come back and you have to sort of get up and uh, just, uh, <laughs> It, get it going again do you know what i mean it's it's um it's tough um especially if you if you try and do you know that down like a sort of sober djing route when it gets to the, those kind of early hours which is why i guess in the summer where it's um you know if you can play the day parties the festivals and stuff i think i saw um a, a post from eats everything who's probably one of my favorite djs and he, he probably actually got me into into DJing, into house mainly. I was an ex of YO and I saw him play with four, four deck mixing and I was just blown away. I don't think I stopped looking at him. I wasn't looking at the rest of the cloud. I was just like straight on him. I was just like, oh my God, that's insane. 
um, another friend of mine who knew him um so we were in the booth as well right and i was just there being like that's this is incredible like, it was small little bits like that which kind of got me into where i am today i suppose but um i saw one of his tour schedules or one of his he sort of sort of catch me at any one of these places today and i think he was playing a park life festival on the main stage from three till five and then he was playing it like fabric from midnight till three and then he got a plane from ibiza and he closed um i can't remember what club it was from like five till seven in the morning and i was like jesus how do you know what i mean like that he's just built different i mean you just, literally you're just like wow this is insane and i think obviously you kind of get used to the, the more regularity these gigs come in and the more that becomes you know a frequent part of your life then yeah. i think you become used to it and you just you, you start to know what your vices are and, and and not in terms of what you can and can't do in terms of what you can and can't drink at that point and you know just like stabilizing um obviously when you get to that level as well you probably have quite a good management team who have been with you for a while and who, who know where you are and can kind of as you're going for the next drink and slap your hand down and just you know what i mean just get make sure you're on, you're on that plane and you're on that 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 bus and stuff so yeah i uh yeah it, it's i think you don't know until you're in you're in it and then you know you, you definitely that there, there are a few times and there will always be a few times where you just you've had a really busy week in the summer like peak festival or peak clubs where you're playing all the time and yeah and then and then all of a sudden you just have to be like right it's probably quite a good idea that i take a little bit of a you know detox a, a, a time to you know get some sleep in and sort of eat some normal foods and you know all that kind of good stuff um but yeah it's it's certainly not a nine to five job i'll give you that or the wrong nine to five <laughs> the wrong nine to five yeah <laughs> i may i i think this is where people like people like james hype who are doing vlogs where they're showcasing their lifestyle and it, it's actually really important because they 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 show the, the how hard and how brutal it is because like you said you gave that example of a schedule for just one dj mm -hmm. and playing three gigs in maybe th in three completely different locations sometimes three different countries within like 12 hours yeah. day you know back to back to back every day during a summer and that is you know i look at that and I personally i i think I can't, I couldn't think of anything worse, like jumping from plane to plane to plane, not having much split sleep. And uh, I think it's really important that people now can have an understanding of like, if they weren't going to aim to be on the top, um, be where you guys are doing, what you guys are doing, where you're playing, actually understand that some big downsides to that and some, especially lifestyle. Cause mate, I can't imagine how much it impacts relationships, uh, social life, like actual social life, because you're, when you're playing gigs you're the so you're the person that is the the kind of like the key to this to the social entity that's happening but they're not your friends they're just you're who you're playing to yeah yeah i mean i the, the amount of um of, of sort of birthdays i have to give up in terms of like my mates who have got yeah just events on the weekend and stuff and you know that's the time where you know that's where your paycheck comes in so you know any anything and that's why i mean even now there's sort of been you know whenever i get invited to a friend's birthday it's like you probably won't be able to come but this which is yeah. quite, which is it's a shame but um um you know i mean it'll be a bit different you know when obviously you've got you know weddings and stuff you have to prioritize a few different things but like um yeah i, I think it, it's really really tough and there's only so much like at the start it was great because i just <laughs> told all my mates if i come to the gig and you put them all on a list and they all come down and then after like week seven they're like yeah we're just gonna go to the pub tonight <laughs> <laughs> oh I just can't be asked to do this again but um um especially if it's a little bit further afield from wherever they all are so yeah I mean, it does it massively impacts social life um and again it, it goes back to the you know the same thing as we we're chatting about with dave getter and stuff but you know you're you're in it because you absolutely love it um and you know it can't all be perks you know because there are so many perks about it but there's got to be a few few drawbacks to it and and you know juggling your social life and just your your lifestyle and your health is really important and they are two things which are quite hard to control if you're fully invested in the industry um and you know i mean especially i mean it, it's, as soon as you get older and you learn these lessons then you know they become easier but um yeah it, it's, it's important to know starting when you're when you're starting out that it's not not plain sailing the entire way through i think um, yeah mate 
Well, like I've I've had an incredible time just digging in a bit more into the stuff that I didn't know about you. We we're fortunate we get to spend a lot of time together. But <laughs> if if there's like if there's anything that you know s- some people who may watch this or at some point get to know who you are, is there anything that you would tell them? Uh, that any advice that you would give to aspiring young like producers or artists? Um. I mean, I mean, to be honest, a lot of what we've been talking about already, really. But um, I think, um, yeah, really put the time in at the start because I really wish I did that. And I was also kind of put off a little bit by um, the kind of, you know, the, the the line of, you know, what's your real job? Do you know what I mean? Like you have this, you know, I'm, I'm actually pursuing DJing and, and, and it's sort of more like, you know, well, OK, well, yeah, when's that hobby going to end? And you're like, well, no, it's not a hobby. It's something I really want to do. And you know, you try and put, you know, the markers in the sand, you know, with like production and everything else and and the bigger gigs you get and, and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I'd say just like push through that because it's, you know, if you really love the industry, I mean, luckily now you've got university courses that actually teach, you know, you can get a DJing degree, I'm fairly sure, and like various things. So it is becoming more like available, which has its pros and cons, right? Because obviously, you know, there's more people in the industry and it's harder to get these sets and stuff. But um i'd say if you, if you really like it just absolutely just put the hours in and it's going to be weekends it's going to be late nights do you know i mean like as a, as a producer i'd say like most of my stuff gets done later at night it's very hard to wake up at nine in the morning with a coffee and just blast out some heavy bass line because that's just it's just it's tough to do but <laughs> I, I, I honestly um um and again it's easier said than done and i wish i'd known this really i wish i'd just put more knowing that it was going to be a career path that i'm actually doing and knowing how amazing it can be when you hit the top jobs or, you know, if you get, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the main stage festival gigs and stuff, I can promise you it's all worth it. I can promise you these evenings in, you know, on a Thursday when you could go to the pub and you just like study and you produce a lot of music or go and have a practice mix and just get out there and, and stuff like, you know, when it, when it all comes to fruition and it builds down, um, there is no greater feeling than, you know, being on a stage performing or or you know having music in the charts or having music released and you know people actually sort of there's a, obviously spotify for artists app right and you can sort of see you can see all over the world where they're listening so you have you know you can see people in outer mongolia just like jamming away to your tracks and you're just like yes <laughs> one more in mongolia one yeah, more yeah yeah one more i mean it's not many <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say, yeah, there, there's all that. And, and again, um, just connection and collaboration is so important, I think. Um, again, it's fairly new to me. If I'd done it when I was, you know, back in the day, I've gone into, you know, more collaboration, more track, you know, work. And, and rather, rather than being so insular with, with all my works and keeping it to myself, I think, you know, if I'd um, kind of let people in, a little bit in and not been so embarrassed about, is my stuff sounding good? um then i would be probably be a few years ahead of where i am now no joke i, I honestly it would have been like miles and miles ahead so um yeah i'd say th- those are the two main things just just hours in um production because you're not going to get anywhere without that at the moment um and, and and yeah that i'd say awesome how do people connect with you what's the best way to how can they help you is it through your spotify is it following your spotify instagram how, how what's the best way to connect yeah so it's i mean it's all constantly the child's um as of the tag um spotify obviously is you know any love for for, for, for streaming tracks and, and all that kind of stuff and like i said got hopefully a lot of things coming out this year um especially actually right now in terms of actually going on to beat for and, and getting that right into the top 10 with transition and madonna so that'd be great and then obviously on socials um Conte the child on, on instagram and stuff i think that's probably where most people are um and yeah, I mean, I suppose if there's any any questions that come off the back of this podcast, you know, if people do want to connect and stuff, then more than happy to to do that. Do that. Awesome. Is is there is there any way we can finesse the system by putting some links down below? Like, what's the best link to get you up those charts? Is it a Beatport uh, link? Is it a Spotify I'll, link? I'll put a bit. Yeah, a Beatport link would be would be amazing. Um, okay, sick. Yeah, let's strike while the arms are. We're on thirty three at the moment. Um, <laughs> And you can see you can see a ton of new music coming to the bottom of the chart. So you're just like you're just gonna push it down. <laughs> Stop. So um, so so yeah, like beat people link and then again just um on socials as well, because you know that's a lot where the booking agents look and stuff like that. So epic. Yeah. 
that'd be that'd be good let's get it out there right Bertie yeah. thank you so much for joining me we're definitely going to do this again we're going to do it in a studio we're going to play some fat rude beats <laughs> and we'll have we'll we'll chill over a beer um but mate thank you so much for spending some time with All me right. like i've really enjoyed it mate thank you very much and yeah next time let's get beer in hand and, and, and do it again awesome peace mate Yes, buddy. Thank you very much. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you haven't already done so, hit the like button down below. Make sure to subscribe so that you can learn from the very best that I'm going to be interviewing at the Summit Club. If you didn't know this already, I also have another podcast called The Unorthodox Podcast that I do with my co-founders, Liam and Mark over at Unorthodox. We're a Web3 marketing consultancy. If you want to go check it out, it's quite a lot of fun. If you want to learn a bit more about crypto and everything Web3, that's the place to come check it out. We interview some of the most interesting people within Web3 and also executives across some of the biggest brands on the planet. Come and join us. The links are also going to be down below in the description and I'll see you next time.